In this section, we're going to start talking about managing your personal finances. Now, some of you probably have a bank account and a credit card, probably some student loans, and maybe even a mortgage. So when we start talking about personal finances, the first thing we want to do is talk about budgets. Making sure you understand your personal finances um, I think the first step to doing that is understanding your budget and keeping it under control. Now, there are things that we might spend regularly on a daily basis that don't seem like a whole lot, but over a period of a long time, like a, a month or a year, it starts to really add up. And so one of the things we want to look at is the things that we spend daily. So in this first example, it talks about Calvin, who isn't rich, but he gets by and he loves sitting down for latte at the college coffee shop. With tax and a tip, he usually spends $5 on his large latte. He gets at least one latte a day and about every three days he has a second latte. Okay, so let's figure out how many lattes that is. Well, once a day, every day, that's 365 lattes. Plus, he gets a second latte every third day. So if I take 365 divided by 3, that gives me 121.667. Let's approximate that to 121 lattes. Because you can't really have two-thirds of a latte. You can't buy two-thirds of a latte. So if I take 365 plus... 121 lattes, that gives me approximately 486 lattes a year. Then if I take 486 times $5, that's going to give me $2,430. And that's how much he spends a year on lattes. So even though you think it's just a little bit, every day, it's not that big deal, I'm just gonna indulge. When you step back and look at how much you're actually spending per month or per year, in this case, it's per year, that's an awful lot of money that you can save on rent or groceries. In fact, if you think about it, it's probably about three months worth of rent for the average college student. In the next example, Cassidy has recently begun keeping her spending under better control, but she still can't fully pay off her credit card. She maintains an average monthly balance of about $1,100, and her card charges a 24% annual interest rate, and it bills at a rate of 2% per month. How much is she spending on credit card interest? So let's look at this two different ways. Let's look at this monthly and then yearly. So in addition to what she's paying a month to try to pay off her credit card, she in addition to that has to pay interest. If we look at this monthly, it says it's 2% interest per month. So if we take 1100 times 0.02, that's going to be $22 extra a month that she's paying in interest. If we look at this yearly, and this is if she keeps an average $1,100 in her account. If she starts spending more, then that amount is going to go up. If you take $1,100 times her annual interest rate, which is 24%, you're going to multiply by 0.24, and you're going to get $264 extra per year. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you minimize using your credit card. And you want to find a way to pay it completely off at the end of every month to try to um, avoid those interest charges. Okay, so to create a budget, the first thing you want to do is you want to list all your monthly income. That includes um, if you get, for example, financial aid that you can use towards your living expenses. Um, and maybe that's given to you twice a year, but you can figure out what 
how to break that up monthly, um, loans and things like that. Um, the hardest part I think for most people is listing your monthly expenses because you have a tenancy, which is good to think about this, but you have your rent and insurance and car payments and no, all those typical things. But what a lot of people seem to forget is the things like Calvin did in the first example, like how much money he was spending today on lattes or just stopping in and buying some new shoes on a whim. Uh, so you want to include everything you spend so that you capture everything and make sure that you have enough income to cover those items. Even though you might not think they're a big deal, they have a tendency to build up fast. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your total expenses from your total income and see what your net monthly cash flow is. And once you see how much your net flow is, if it's in the negative, that's not good. That means you're spending more than you're, you're receiving money. Um, and then if your, your net, net flow is positive, then you know you're able to maybe even save some of that money in your savings account. Now, if you're in the negative, you're gonna to have to figure out some way to make adjustments to try to get into the positive. Okay, so in the first example, it talks about, um, addition to your monthly expenses, you have the following college expenses that you pay twice a year. You have $3,500 for your tuition each semester, $750 in student fees each semester, $800 for textbooks each semester. And we want to figure out how should you handle these expenses in computing your monthly budget. So, if you have twice a year for each semester, you have to pay $3,500. That's twice a year. That's going to give us $7,000 each year. Then you have $750 in student fees each semester. So that's 750 times two for each semester. That's 1,500. And then you have $800 for textbooks per semester. So we're gonna multiply that by two to figure out what the yearly expenses are. When we add all that up, we get yearly expenses of $10,100. And this is per year. So now if we want to figure out on average how much it's going to cost us per month, we want to take the uh, 10100 and divide by 12 to get approximately how much this is going to cost us to live per month. If I take the 10100 divided by 12, that's going to give me $841.67. And this is per month. Now this is just for school. This isn't including your monthly uh, rent or insurance or car payments or anything else. This is just talking about school. Okay, so in the next example, we're adding in some more stuff. We're gonna actually look at income versus expenses. So let's make a list here. On this side, we're gonna do income. And this side, we're going to do expenses. So monthly, there's $700 for rent. This is monthly now. <clears throat> $120 for gas monthly. Um, and then $140 for health insurance. $75 for car insurance. $25 for renter's insurance, $110 for your cell phone, $100 for utilities, $300 for groceries, $250 for entertainment. So that means probably eating out or just going shopping on a whim. And then in it, those are all the monthly payments. And then addition to that, in the entire year, she spends 
for the whole year for her college expenses. So if we want to figure out what that is monthly, since we're making a monthly list, I have to divide that by 12. <clears throat> then she spends about $1,000 on gifts and friends and $1,500 <clears throat> for vacations. And those two are yearly as well. So I want to make sure I divide both of those by 12 so I can figure out since we're making a list for monthly expenses. And then about $800 on clothes. So 800 divided by 12. These are all yearly items. <clears throat> and then $600 in gift stick charities. So 600 divided by 12. Her income, so this is a list of all her expenses. Her income consists of a monthly after-tax paycheck of about $1,600, this is per month, and $3,000 scholarship that she receives at the beginning of the school year. So she gets, for the whole year, she gets $3,000, so we have to divide that by 12 to figure out what the monthly income is. Let's make a note of this. This is monthly. So if it's something yearly, we want to make sure we divide by 12. Okay, we're going to find her total monthly cash flow. So if I take 1600 and I add it to 3000 divided by 12, she ends up taking in $1,850 per month. Okay, when I add up all of her expenses, remembering to take the yearly stuff and divide by 12, don't forget that. When I add all of this stuff, you get expenses of $3,145. That definitely puts her in the negative. She's spending way more than what her monthly income is. So once you look at this, if I subtract, 3145 minus 1850, she's in the negative $1,295. So one of the things that I would do if I were in Brianna's plays was look at how much she's spending on gifts for family and friends, the amount for vacations, um, clothes are necessity, but maybe try to cut back a little bit. Um, and do $600 in gifts to charity, cut back on that. Anything that is not a necessity, try to cut back on. And then even past that, if you still need more money, you can do like coupon cutting or look for sales um, and things like that. When adjusting your budget, there are no set rules. You just need to be creative to come up with something that makes sense for you. And sometimes looking at what other people spend puts things into perspective for you. And this chart here is a chart from the U.S. Department of Labor and Bureau of Labor Statistics. And so this is broken up into age groups on the percentage of items or categories um, that are spent for different age groups. Okay, now it says you've worked up a budget and you find that you have $1,500 per month available for all your personal expenses combined. So according to the spending averages in the figure below, how much should you be spending on rent? Now for me personally, I fall into the blue range from 35 to 64. So when I look at the range for housing, if I look at that for housing, because we're looking about at rent, it's a little bit more than 30, but less than 40. So let's approximate this. Again, there's no set rules. There's no right or wrong answer. This is just a way to put things into perspective. Um, I'm going to approximate that at about 35%. So this chart is telling me that I should be spending about 35% of my budget on housing, whether that's rent or a mortgage. I wanna find 35% of $1,500. 
So I'm going to take 1,500 times 0.35, and I'm going to get $525. So when I'm sitting down and making a budget, this gives me a rough idea of how much I should be spending on rent. In the next example, this is actually something that I'm going through right now myself, is looking to purchase a new car. Um, my car now is getting a little bit older and it's starting to need a lot more repairs. And I'm in some gray area here where I'm trying to decide, would it be financially worth it if I buy a new car and spend the money up front, but be better off in the long run, or should I just hold off and keep paying for um, the expenses of fixing the car that I have now? Um, a new car would get better gas mileage, but I might have less insurance um, if I stick with my older car versus a new car. So there's a lot of things to weigh in. Um, and so there's no right or wrong answer to these. You, it's truly just stepping back and using mathematics to help you make a decision. Now the same decision or the same conclusion might not be the best for every person. There are different factors for different people. Someone might have um, children that they also have to take into consideration and they have to add more money into their budget to take care of them. Someone might have a sick parent. There might be other circumstances that you have to add in that someone else might not. But some of the basic things that you want to look at is gas mileage of the old car versus the new car, expenses versus the old car and the new car to help you look at the financial aspect of it and then consider your personal aspects and think about it long term to help you make a decision. So let's split this into two sides here. Current car versus a new car. Okay, so George commutes both to his job and to school and he drives about 250 miles per week. His current car is fully paid off, which is a bonus, so he doesn't have to make monthly payments, but it is getting older and he spends about $1,800 per year on repairs for the cars. Okay, the, the car gets only about 18 miles per gallon because it's an older car. And he's thinking about buying a new car that up front will cost him 25,000, but he, he's gonna get 54 miles per gallon, which is much better gas mileage. And he's gonna have maintenance free at least for the first few years since it's a new car. And so he's trying to make a decision, should he go for buying the new car? So one thing we're going to compare is gas mileage. How much is he going to pay in gas per year? If he drives a total of 250 miles per week, 250 miles per week is 13,000 miles per year because there are 52 weeks in a year. So if you take 250 and multiply it by 52, you're going to get 13,000 miles per year. So we have 13,000 miles per year. Now with his old car, the current car that he has right now, he gets 18 miles per gallon. And on average, as of right now, I would estimate that the average price per gallon is probably $3. So if I multiply that all out, I have 13,000 over one times one over 18 times three over one, that's gonna give me let's see, about $2,166.67 per year in gas. That's just an estimate. You don't know if he's going to take the car on a trip or anything like that. This is just an estimate. Okay, now let's look at repairs. Um, for repairs, it says he pays 1800 
approximately per year. And monthly payments he has none. He said the car was paid off. So for the current car, he has, if you take, let's see, the $2,166.67 and add it to the $1,800 per year, he's paying approximately 3966.67 per year. And if you want, you can break that down into months by dividing by 12, which would be approximately $330.56, approximately per month. Now, let's figure out what the gas mileage would be for the new car. So he's still going to be driving 13,000 miles per year, right? Because it's the 250 miles per week, but there's 52 weeks in a year, so we multiply it by 52. Now, this states that he's going to get with the new car about 54 miles per gallon. And we're going to consider that the average gas uh, price for each gallon is about $3 as of right now. And when we multiply all of that out, we're going to get $722.22 on gas per year. Now, because it's a new car, for the first few years, we're going to assume that the repairs are $0 other than putting some windshield wiper fluid and changing the oil, there's going to be no major repairs because it's the new car. He is going to have a monthly payment because it's a new car. We don't know what that monthly payment is. It doesn't say it in the problem. So we can see what the savings would be and then figure out what that savings would be over the five-year period where he suspects that he would have no major repairs and see if that adds up or comes close to about 25,000. If it does, it might be worth it. So if we take 722.22 times five, that's gonna be about $3,611.10. So this is what he would be paying for five years with the new car. And we would have to take this number here and multiply it by five to see how much he's paying per year for the old car. If I multiply that by five, he's paying about $19,833.35 for five years with the old car with the repairs and the gas. So if I take the difference in these numbers, it will show me how much he's saving over the five-year period. So if I take $19,833.25 and subtract the $3,611.10, that's about $16,200. $22.15 that he's saving if he's buying a new car on gas and repairs. Now that amount of money could go towards the price of the new car. So there is still a difference. It doesn't quite come up to the $25,000. So this is where you would take your personal um, situation into consideration. Do you have other things that you need to spend the money on? Do you have kids? Do you have a sick parent? Um, do you plan on taking a trip where you're going to need a newer car? Um, there are other things that you need to take into consideration. But the math says that in gas and in repairs, you'll save about $16,000 over the five years. From there, it should be your decision 
on whether or not you go with a new car versus um, keeping your older car. All right, in the next example, we're going to look at the difference in salaries for a college graduate versus um, someone who did not graduate from college. And it says the average median salary for a full time worker um, of age 25 or older who is a college graduate with a bachelor's degree or higher is $64,127 per year. While the average person with only a high school diploma earns $36,318 per year. And based on this data, we're going to figure out how much more the college graduate earns over a typical 40-year uh, career. So if we take the difference of the $64,127 and the $36,318, when we subtract those, we're going to see that a college graduate makes $20,807 more on average per year. Now, this is per year, so if we look at this over 40 years, if I take the $27,807 and multiply it by 40 years, that comes out to $1,112,360 over the 40 years. So the average college graduate earns more than a million uh, over a career of about 40 years. This doesn't include your college cost, of course. Some of that money is going to have to go to paying back your student loans if you have any, but it still looks like it's financially worth it in the long run to go to college. Okay, and the last example says across all institutions, the average cost of a three credit college class is approximately $1,500. Suppose that between class time, commute time, and study time, the average class requires about 10 hours a week of your time and assume that you could have had a job paying $10 an hour during that time that you're studying and going to school. And we're gonna see the, what the net cost of the class is compared to actually working. So for us, it rogues, a semester is 16 weeks. And so if I take 16 weeks, and I multiply that by 10 hours a week, that's gonna be about 160 hours of work for the entire semester. So for those 160 hours, if you worked during those hours instead of going to school, and you made approximately $10 an hour, That would be about $1,600 of missing wages. If we add that cost of missing wages to the cost of the class, which is $1,500, that's going to be a total cost of $3,100. So that means if you take out the hours that you would be working plus the cost of class, it would cost you about $3,100 to go to school and that's without fees and books and everything else that you would need to take into consideration. Now, whether or not you make that decision and if it's worthwhile to you is up to you and that's a decision that you have to make what we're trying to do in this class is show you the math that would help you be able to make that decision. The decision is totally up to you. And something to consider is, remember in the previous example, we did see that over the 40-year career, 
most college graduates would make a million dollars more than someone that doesn't have a college degree. You have to think about um, not only the little things that are right in front of you, like how to uh, afford your car payment and those kinds of things. Can you afford to go to school right now? But you also want to take into consideration the long-term um, consequences or benefits.